please welcome onto stage Professor Peter Hawkins. We're going to talk about what has coaching achieved and how is this next period of time going to require something different. But I'm going to do something which is very dangerous to do straight after lunch, which is I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes <laughs> and just make sure that none of you fall asleep. Could you put your right hand on your heart and close your eyes? This is a test to see how many people know where their heart is. <laughs> and close your eyes and just picture and allow to come up on your internal screen all the people who benefit today from you, who you are, your work, maybe your children, partners, parents, colleagues, clients, customers. Just notice all those people. Perhaps say to them as they come up, thank you for letting me make a difference. And then I'm going to invite you just to lean a little into the future. Not fall off your chair, but lean into the future and imagine who might come over the horizon in the next two or three or four years, which might bring you some new challenges. And allow yourself to be surprised about who you might see and what they might be asking you to help them with. And what are those people in two or three years' time, what is it they need you to learn this afternoon? In order that they can be people you make a difference to in three, four, five years' time. What is it that you need to learn today it will be of value to at least a hundred people in your future. What might, in three years' time, you regret not having learnt today? In order that you can make a difference to those people who life will send you as your next challenge. And once you've got an answer, open your eyes, just turn to the person next to you and just share whatever answers came about what, what am I going to regret not having learned today, possibly, in three years' time? What do my future stakeholders need me to learn today? So turn to the person next to you. If you don't have an answer, get your question in first. <laughs> All right, can we bring those conversations to a close? I, I, I hope you haven't finished the conversation, because otherwise you get attached to the answer you've already come up with. And we want to have half answers that we can play with together. So can I just hear from just two, or three, four people, what, what sort of things came up for you about what your stakeholders of tomorrow are going to need you to learn today? And, and we'll see how we might start to do that learning together. Learn. They're going to need you to learn. And what are they going to need you to learn? Or what sort of learning? I just get better at what I'm doing. Right, they're going to need me to learn to get better at what I'm doing. What else? Right at the back. Can you shout it out? 
Humility. So to learn to humility. What else? What? Did anyone get any surprising answers? They weren't expecting. Right. We'll do this again at the end and see if we can get some really surprising, changed answers. What? What other things do people come up with? Better strategy. So who's that? Better strategy for. So how do we always coach what's in front of us? Okay, so let me, one more, David. Why we do what we do, why I do what I do. Okay, so they, they'll need us to learn today, why are we doing what we're doing? And, and who and what is it in service of? Very important question. So let me tell you, see, I think that where we really learn coaching it's not on the training courses, not even in supervision, despite what I said this morning. It's when we're faced with the next client that brings us the next challenge. I want to give you just a quick story and ask you what you'd have done in this situation. I, I've been fortunate enough to constantly find myself in situations where I, I had no idea what to do next. So I found myself, after the changes in South Africa, coaching the fruit industry. Um, I was first brought into what was then Kate, uh, Outspan. We did all the citrus fruit. I helped them through a process where they merged with Cape Fruit, which did all the apples and pears and grapes and stone fruit. They didn't want to merge. But they were in a time when they'd just gone through the massive changes in South Africa. Fruit for those of you who don't know South Africa, it's the third largest industry in the country. Two and a half million people economically dependent upon it. At this time, the big retailers around the world were merging, buying up each other. There were fewer customers. Each of the big retailers, who were their main customers, were cutting their fruit suppliers from 300 down to about 12. At this time, South Africa was going through a massive political change. And in their wisdom, these two organizations were owned by the government, and they handed them over to the farmers. So you had the, the suppliers controlling the marketing entities around the world. And believe me, African white fruit farmers aren't known for having a global mindset. Yeah? So I was brought down to facilitate the first board after the merger. There were 36 people there, right? all white. One woman in the room who was the HR director, right? Like many mergers, they'd come in two by two. It's what I call the Noah's Ark uh, law of mergers, right? One from either side go in together, but they go, out one, they go in two by two and out one by one. So they've done this big merger, and we were having to come up in two days through team coaching with a new vision, new mission, new strategy, and new core values for this new merged company in a new post-apartheid South Africa. Global business. And remember, there are two and a half million people economically dependent on getting this right. So I'm working on it. I got more in small groups, mixed up, small tables, doing nice little workshop stuff, well facilitated. And now the chief executive comes up to me and says, listen, and he said, Peter, this is not working. And I said, yeah, I know. The energy is somewhere off the floor. No energy, no engagement. They're going through the motions. And I said to him, so John, what do you think we should do about it? He said, that's what I'm paying you for. I said, thank you. <laughs> I turned to my colleague and I said, look, what are we going to do about this? Because the, the mistrust in the level, and there's 400 years of mistrust between the northern farmers and the southern farmers, between the fruit suppliers and the marketeers, between the people who work in the overseas entities and the people who work in South Africa, right? I said, what are we going to do about it? He says, Peter, you're leading this. <laughs> and I want you to, to, to ask yourself the question, what, what would you do? I had no idea what to do. So turn to the person next to you, and if, again, if you don't know what you would do, ask them. What would you do in that situation? Very quickly, just ask them, what would you do?
Uh, okay, let, let, let's just pause there. Let, let's see, let's see who, who already has got some supervision for me. I'm standing there, I'm in the middle of this very expensive golf resort in George, in South Africa, in the late 1990s, and I don't know what to do, I get on the phone, so who's going who's to supervise me? What, what, what should I do? You have some supervision for me? Um, yeah, um, you're getting them to talk about mission, they're not happy, they're not trusting. Get them to talk about something unthreatening where they might find common ground. Get them each to share with each other somebody who they really admire and why. Oh, great. Um, Somebody they really admire and why. Yeah, so we, we, we could do that. We could, but very important, and indeed, um, some of you may have seen that uh, Billy Esterhazy did some work with the ANC in exile and the chief executives in South Africa prior to the changes. And on the Friday night, they did exactly that. When they first flew in, it was done in the UK, secret location, it had to be kept out of the press. They were only allowed to talk about on the Friday night, their family, right, and their hobbies. Nothing else. So we get some human contact. Okay, we did a bit of that, right? We did some all sorts of things um, on, the, on the Friday evening when they first arrived. But once we got into doing this work, right, that went out the window. So what else might I do? Yes, <laughs> it's true, culturally, Afrikaners like something that's blunt and direct and big, right? The only problem is I'm British, and I'd be in danger of starting Boer War Mark III, right? Okay, so what else might I do? I find another supervisor, yep. Yeah, I could. I could try that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure they would participate, no, but <laughs> yeah. Somebody else. Right. So, so we've got to find a common something common that they like. The, tr the trouble is, the people in the south would, would, would draw apples, the people in the north would dr draw lemons and grapefruits, and the people in the west would draw grapes. Girls have a game of rugby. teams and a group hug. Yeah. I, actually, interestingly, when I did a merger, I was involved with the PricewaterhouseCoopers Live Brand merger, and, and we did do, we mixed all, that, all the teams, and we gave them shirts from some of the top Europeans, and, and we did do five-a-side football with them, which actually had quite an effect including um, quite a few injuries. But <laughs> and, and that's the problem. I don't know how many there would have been at the second day if we had a rugby game, because a lot of them were of a certain age. I share the problem with them. Yeah, I, that's really nice. Um, now, you see, let's just take those. So what did I do? Not knowing what to do, I said to Peter, all right, you keep the process going. He's Peter, my colleague. And I went across to the big window looking out towards the mountains to pray. <laughs> right? And I looked at the hills and I said, look, I have no idea what to do next. What should I do, hills? Right? So if you're stuck in a situation, look beyond it, I thought. And you know, within minutes, my prayers were answered. Because as I looked out of the window, a coach turned up. Not, not a coach like all the people in this room, a bus coach. <laughs> and as I looked at the coach, I realized it was the wives of the board members and the executives, right? Remember? Including the one male wife, yes, of the HR director. And I looked at this coach and I thought, look, there's more energy and there's more fantastic connection on that coach than there is in this room. So I said to Peter, you keep the event going. And I ran out of the hotel. And I jumped on the bus, on the coach, right? And I said to them, have you had a great morning? They said, yes, fantastic, you know, all this kind of energy and stuff. And I said, look, your, your husbands are working very hard, but they're struggling. Um, you know, could, could you help me? I thought, you know, I don't know where else to go. <laughs> My supervisor isn't answering the phone. 
And they said, we'd love to. You know, we're fed up with going on jollies. We'd love to help. What can we do? I said, I've no idea. Come in a side room with me. We'll work it out. And they all came in. And I said, hey, hey, what about you being a trial audience for them tonight at 6 o'clock? Said, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, and I said, give them some feedback. They said, yeah, what should we give them feedback on? I said, why don't you work it out? Let's split it into threes and come up with, you know, what's the six most important things to give them feedback on? And I said, oh, well, by the way, and work out a scoring mechanism. And they came up with the best list of feedback I could possibly have wished for. Number one was, are we proud to be married to you, given what we've just heard? <laughs> Number two was, do we think you're all spe- on the same hymn sheet? Do we think you're all aligned? Number three was, do we think you're actually going to follow through on this? Do we think it's inspirational and will inspire people? Do we think it's realistic? And they came up with a scoring system on it, on each of them. Right? I went back into the room. I said, pause whatever you're doing, because I've got some good news and some bad news. Which do you want first? They said, the good news. I said, I've got a great trial audience for you tonight. Right? So you can really, really get some feedback on your vision, your values, your strategy, and your mission, your vision. They said, so what's the bad news? I said, it's your wives. And here is what they're going to give you feedback on. I have never seen a team transform quicker <laughs> than what happened in that room that afternoon, right? Because now, it wasn't just that they had something in common, right? They had something in common in their guts, which was, we do not want to look like idiots, right? Now, whenever I share that story, people say, but what happened, what would you have done if the coach didn't turn up? But something will, but... The, the print, the, the, this story I'm telling not just because it was one of my, you know, the, the next year, by the way, they invited me back and uh, the wife said they wanted to be more involved in the, in the whole workshop. And we did some stuff. This is, this, is, this is just after the change. We did stuff on transcultural capacity and competence in which the husbands and wives both did it and then gave feedback to each other and shared their... Their, their feedback scores. And then we went to Robin Island and were taken around by a prisoner. Right? And I was up till about three in the morning just emotionally debriefing that experience because these had been, you know, the, the, these had been members of the Brudevant, they'd been the sons and daughters of people who'd been part of the apartheid cabinet. You know, this was, uh, what a privilege. What a privilege to do. But what, what, what I'm saying, now, now why this story? Because what I want to suggest is that coaching has been incredibly successful in the last 30 years, but that what's got us to here will not get us successful in the next 30. That actually we have to be, somebody as I came around said, I have to be, what was it, what was yours? I have to be braver. Interestingly, we did some research with CEOs. What did they value about coaches? The most top thing that came out, we want our coaches to challenge us more, right? And one of them said to me, but, you know, I've got 300 people, Peter, who tell me what they think I want to hear. I need my coach to tell me what I'm not hearing, what I'm not seeing, what I'm not saying, and what I'm not doing, right? But he said, by the way, Peter, when they do so, I'll give them a bloody hard time, but that's what I pay them for. He said it like that. So be, be bolder, but be, be prepared for the comeback. <laughs> what, what was it you said, Lisa? You said to go from individual to organization. So let's first of all look at what we've achieved. Um, David Clutterback said to me over dinner last night, he said, Peter, we're, we're two of the last old farts standing. <laughs> I thought, I said, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but you know, having been involved with coaching almost since it began in this con- in UK, I think we've achieved a lot in the last 30 years. Uh, Henley do a survey every year on leadership development and and what people are are, are investing their money in. Coaching comes out number one as the most preferred form of leadership development. This is across countries, across 60 countries, several hundred people filling it in. High satisfaction ratings from those being coached. But before you feel good about that, 
As, as was it David said this morning, who doesn't want someone to sit there and listen to them for an hour? Right? Managers and leaders far more self-aware. We've moved the, the world of leadership development from, from, from IQ to EQ. However, now we need to move it from, not only from IQ to EQ, but to WeQ. And then more than WeQ, and I'll come on to that. The growth of internal coaching communities, managers learning coaching skills, expectation of all coaches having supervision, growth in team coaching and systemic team coaching. But what's got us to here will not get us to there. Now, why am I saying that? 2008, the banking crisis, which wasn't a banking crisis. Economic crisis? No, it wasn't an economic crisis. It was a time when we had a big wake-up call that what we were doing was coming up against the limits to growth and the limits of global working and trust and that we needed to wake up and do something different. Have we learned the lessons? That's a good question. But... I stood up at a conference just in, at the end of the, the financial crisis, I think it was early 2009, and I said, look, we know Lehman Brothers, RBS, many of those big banks that went broke employed lots of coaches and had internal coaches. They spent a lot of money on coaching in America and in the UK. Yeah. So what, I said, were we doing while the banks were burning as coaches? Good question. We know that Enron employed coaches. BP employed co lots of coaching. Right? What were we doing? And somebody put their hand up right at the back. I said, yes. He said, it's obvious what coaches were doing while the banks were burning. He said, maybe to you, but it's not to me. What were they doing? He said, they were sending their invoices in quickly. <laughs> and I started to laugh like you've done, right? And then I gulped, I thought, what does that say about our profession? Right? And then I got all this defensiveness, well, you know, we're only responsible for process, not for, for, for what people do with it. People weren't prepared to look at what do we need to learn from the banking crisis. So let me set that in context. Any profession, any organisation, this is the Reg Revens formula for organisational survival. If the profession and the organization is not learning fast than the environment is changing, it's on the road to extinction. We've been very successful, but, but, but notice, companies who are very successful are often the last to learn. Right? Olivetti was number one in typewriters. Kodak was number one in film. If you're successful, you're the last to get the news that the world is changing. Yeah? Success is a barrier to learning. And I've spent a lot of time kind of working with, so one of the things we know is that the world, um, I've just been reading a book about hyperchange. Change is getting faster and more complex, more interconnected. Peter Senge, some of you know his work, recently in a talk he said, which I thought was put it really very, very well, for millennia we have known as human beings how to flourish in localized niches. But now... For better or worse, we have created one global interconnected niche, economically, politically, socially. And as a species, we have no idea how to flourish in one global interconnected niche. <coughs> I think that's requiring a level of evolution in human consciousness way beyond anything we've had to face previously. Lisa very nicely came up to me this morning and said, she was at a workshop I did in December, and she, um, I thought I ought to write it down. She told me something I'd said there and I'd forgotten, which was we could no longer, as a species, afford to evolve one person at a time. Evolve consciousness one person at a time. So I've been working with, if the, if the environment's changing, then, you know, strategy has changed all the time, but as, as um, David quoted Peter Drucker this morning, one of his famous quotes is, culture will always eat your strategy for breakfast. Yeah, and it's easier to change the strategy than it is the culture. We have another one line that says, leadership get the culture they collectively behave. So it's no good having a, a leadership development business and a coaching business, and then you the organization that has somebody else to its culture change and someone else to its strategy consultancy because the real challenge doesn't lie in any of those boxes, it lies in the connections. What, how do we shift the leadership to 
to live the culture that they need to have to deliver the, the strategy to adapt to the hyper-change world. Now, I upset all my strategy colleagues by reducing all the strategy to one question. So David talked about good questions. This is my favorite. What is it you can uniquely do that the world of tomorrow needs? Yeah? Not that your customers of today like and give you nice feedback on, but what is it you can uniquely do? And some people say to me, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm not unique. But nobody has <coughs> the history that Victoria's got. Nobody's got Pippa's connections. Yeah? Nobody's got your range of experience. Right? If you put all those together, your connections, your knowledge, your experience, your, your, your skills, your personality, what, put that all together, that gives you your uniqueness. I, I, I interviewed Lord Victor Adibawali on Tuesday, who, who I worked with when he was, well, he still is, Chief Executive at Turning Point, the only real people's peer. You know, he went in at 38, working class, black with dreadlocks, to be a member of the House of Lords. He talked about the Dundee drop, which was... I said, what's a Dundee drop? He said, well, when I first walked into the, the restaurant in the House of Lords, the jaws went... <laughs> as I walked through, right? Anyway, he said to me, I asked him what advice he would give to young leaders, of to, you know, leaders of tomorrow, and he said, um, the first thing I would say is, be yourself, don't try and be anyone else, because all these other spaces are already occupied. I thought, that's a nice quote. Now, we need to ask, what, what can I uniquely do that World of Tomorrow needs, and how do I accelerate my development to meet those needs? So, and we'll come on to what is it that coaching profession can uniquely do that the World of Tomorrow needs. But somebody, I, I've been using this question for years, and somebody, very rightly, when I got to about 60, said, so Peter, what's your answer? Right? I thought, well, I should really think about that, you know, because I got to a place where I, I can choose what work I do. And I decided that the people who were keeping me working were these four little people. This is Nancy, Charlie, Iris, and Freddie. There's a fifth one, but she's not sitting up yet, called Florence, right? They come in every talk that I give now, because they're my grandchildren, and as I'm getting older, that's the only way I remember all their names, <laughs> by having to complete... Now, why are they keeping me working? I, I presented this to, to a lot of accountants the other day, and they said, well, it's obvious, Peter, why they're keeping you working. You're having to subsidise all their parents' mortgages. <laughs> and I said, yes, I do have that privilege. I've got two of them living in London, all right? But I said, you know, that's not why they're keeping me working, <coughs> right? I sold my consultancy firm to deal with the, their parents' mortgages, why they're keeping me working is the one thing I can absolutely guarantee to you about the world of tomorrow is that when those four little people grow up, inshallah, they get through school, God willing, they get university, go out to the world of work and become leaders, they will face far, far bigger challenges than anything that my most privileged generation has had to face. Right? And I would argue we are still developing people to be the leaders of yesterday, not the leaders of tomorrow. Why am I so confident about that? I, um, I get the, the privilege of flying to many different parts of the country, working with many different sorts of organizations. I don't yet know, have not yet met an organization in the last 10 years who is not suffering from what I call the unholy trinity. Right? The unholy trinity is... You've got to do more at higher quality with less resource. However, I still come across people, even in the public sector in the UK, who say to me, oh, when we get through this period of austerity, we get back to normal, right? And I say to them, if anyone says that to you, I would really encourage you to say, have you not heard the news? When they say what news, you say normal has been abolished. This unholy trinity of do more at higher quality with lower cost and more sustainably is going to be with us right through my grandchildren's lives, not only my lives. Why am I so confident? Let's just look at three corners of this triangle. The world's population today is 7.34 billion, right? Probably 7.35 by the time I finish the talk. 
Right, 7.34 billion. 9 billion is the average prediction of how many people we will have living on this planet in 2050. That's just the average of the spread, right? Maybe higher, maybe slightly lower. So please tell me, you've got some idea how old I am now, if you were listening. What was the population the year I was born? And if anyone's heard me do this before, please don't say. All right, hold up number of fingers of how many billion people were, were living on this earth the day I was born. So we've got three, five, four, six, four, four, three, five, four, five, five. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> was that just a one? One billion. It, the, the world's population, the year I was born, was 2.4 billion. So you were closer than the people who said five and six. I'd have had to have been born in 1830 for it to be one. But, the, but I have therefore seen the world's population treble in my own lifetime. Treble. Now please tell me which previous generation saw the world's population treble in their own lifetime. There are two possible answers. It's either Adam and Eve, right? Or it's the people, the first Homo sapiens on the African savannah, whichever story you prefer. Right? It has not happened in the whole of human history. If I'd been born in 1830... First time it got to one billion, I'd have had to, it took the whole of human history to, to 1830 to get to one billion. It took another century to double. I've now seen it treble. Right. So we could deal with that, with technology and internet and all the rest of it. But let's look at the second one. How many internet connecting devices are there in the world that go into the, uh, the World Wide Web and the internet? Would you guess? Ted? <laughs> 10 million? More? Less? More? What? Higher! <laughs> what, what would you guess? 40. Well, it, we know it's at least over 25 billion. And it's, 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 you know, you can't keep up with it. It's at least three times more than there are people in the world. Why is that important? Because we now, I would argue, have grown expectations faster than we've grown people. Right? We have seen an even bigger exponential growth in expectations. So I'm dealing with uh, the National Health Service. I talked to two doctors five years ago who are world experts on livers. They said to me, Peter, the world changed five years ago. So that makes it ten years back. They said, the first time people came into our clinics, we're meant to be the world thought leaders in this area. They'd read more of the research than we have because they've got time to go on to Google. We don't. They knew exactly where the best treatment was in the world. They knew exactly what it cost. And they then banged the table and said, why were they not getting it? That is the world we live in. Anything that you do can be benchmarked anywhere in the world. Um, I, a colleague of uh, uh, David and I, from some time at Trevor Wardock, did a lot of work in sub-Saharan Africa. He says mobile telephony has transformed leadership across um, and business across sub-Saharan Africa. You used to go and give whatever you wanted, to the farmer for his coffee. Now he goes onto his mobile phone and says, wait a moment, this is what you're offering 10 miles down the road, this is what you're offering in the next country, and this is what you're selling it for in Hong Kong, and this is your profit margin. How come you're ripping me off? Right? That's the world we live in. Now, if you put those two together, the World Bank estimated that today we are using 150% of what the Earth produces in natural resources every year. So we're always using mortgage in the future. They predict that with growing population, rising expectations, right, on, on the straight graph, we would need five Earths by the time we get to 2050 to support expectations and population. And the one thing we know is we've only got one Earth. David Attenborough recently said, he quoted um, somebody from further back to say, Anybody who believes in indefinite growth on a finite planet is either mad or an economist or a humanistic psychologist. I added that last bit, sorry. Okay, so why are my grandchildren keeping me working? Because if they live and become leaders, and I'm still alive, 30 years' time, and they turn to me, these are the sort of questions I think they might ask. What were you coaches doing while you were creating a, a VUCA, or VUCA, volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous world? You've heard that? What were coaches and leaders doing in your greatly privileged world when you were leaving us a legacy of a world of greater demand, growing expectations, and diminishing resources? 
right? And I want to be able to look them in the eye and have an answer. So what does I think, you know, what's got us to here is not going to get us to there to have an answer to my grandchildren. So what do I think we can do about it? I'm going to talk about these five quite briefly. Right? This is based on um, supervising coaches and team coaches around the world. It's based on research I've done um, in companies on, on the receivers of coaching. Um, it's based on research we've done on coaches. Let me just... First one. When I speak to CEOs, they say to me, look, the real challenges in our organization don't lie in the divisions or in the individuals. They lie in the connections. D D David sort of quoted me on this. Yeah? The trouble is, consultants consult to the parts and coaches coach the individuals. But the real challenges lie in the connections. And we haven't yet learned how to coach the spaces between individuals, between teams. So just moving from individual coaching to team coaching to organizational coaching is not enough because we just move the, move the level of system or, 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 or unit that we're looking at. We have to be able to learn how do we coach the spaces between. So let's look at that. It took me 25 years of coaching at least before I woke up to the fact that I was acting as a supplier and a provider, not as a partner. Yeah? It took me 25 years to wake up to the fact. I used to ask people, what's your name? Owen. Owen. Owen, you know, what, what would you like from coaching? <laughs> and I would look him in the eye. Now, what happens when I do that? First of all, if I look him in the eye and ask, and ask him, I trigger his left hemisphere neocortex, I now realize. Secondly, I put him back at school. Oh, somebody's asking me a question. I better have an answer. And he'll make one up. Right? I then looked back at my life and I said, when in my life did I know the development I needed? Somebody once asked me, how did I know I was ready to have children? And I said, if I'd asked that question, I'd still not have any. Right? Life decided that I needed the next lesson. I had children. You know, I believe if I look back, who knew the development I needed? Well, my children and my wife knew more than I did. My colleagues, the people I was the leader of, knew more than I did about the development I needed. My stakeholders knew more than I did. But actually, life knew even better and gave me the next bit of development when I was busy planning some other development. Does that make sense? So why do we ask that question? Why did it take me so long to wake up to that? So now, I go shoulder to shoulder with Owen. I look into the fire and I say, what's the work? Are you married? What's the work that your family, your colleagues, people you lead, your organization's customers, your stakeholders, what is the work your stakeholders need us to do together that you can't do by yourself, but that we can address together? And by the way, it took me even longer to wake up. At the end, I used to ask, what's been helpful about this and what could be more helpful? Now I don't. I say, actually, Owen, if, if, if your wife had been in on this conversation we've just had, yeah, and the people you lead were in on this conversation, what would they have valued about the work we've done together? And what would their challenge be to us about what more we could have done? So I now say there should never be just two people in a coaching room. I mean, you know, sometimes there may be just two people present physically, but we need empty chairs. I said to some, I went to visit some coaches I supervised down in South Africa, and they took me around their new coaching rooms. I said, but you've only got two chairs in there. You need some empty chairs so that people can occupy and bring the stakeholder voice into the room. Yeah? So now I see that he's not my client. Together, in partnership, we are facing, your stakeholders are our joint client. Yeah, your wife. <laughs> Go home and tell her she... We've done some work for her today. Okay? So we have to start off and say, you know, who is our coaching in service of? And what, what is it they require? What's the work they require? I used to do team coaching and ask people, what do you want from team coaching? And you would say, oh, well, 
Keep away from speaking. You would say, oh, well, we need team coaching to sort David out. And I'd go to David and say, no, no, we need team coaching to sort him out. And all I would get was all your interpersonal conflict. <laughs> now I would ask, what is it you as a team, what is it your world is asking you as a team to step up to, you're struggling to step up to? What are your stakeholders of tomorrow? What are, you, what are you as a team going to regret not having addressed today in two years' time? All the questions which are outside in and future back, not past forward. Yeah? So the, oh and by the way, this is... Um, I, I chair a, a, a business in South Wales, just up the valleys here, which I'll show you, if we've got time, show you a... Ooh, we might not have... I can show you a quick video. I'll play it over the tea break if you can watch it. Called Connect Assist, where we've we've built in a coaching culture, 120 people in the valleys, um, and uh, every year as chairman, non-executive non chairman, I do a, a, a chairman's report based on what value have we received from each of those six stakeholder groups, and what value have we given back? Yes, not just to the investors, not just to the employees, not just to the customers, not just to the partners and suppliers but the communities in which we operate, what have we done for the local community, and what have we done for the more than human world, the environment and the ecology. Have we given back more than we've taken from any of those six? Because I would argue in today's world, unless we are constantly co-creating shared value for all six, we are not a sustainable business. That applies in the public sector or the private sector. By the way, the 13th fairy is sitting there. <coughs> That is, comes from Sleeping Beauty. Any of you might have got the reference? Remember the Sleeping Beauty, the, the bad fairy that gives the curse is the one that's not invited to the party. Every organization I go into has a 13th fairy. The stakeholder they're not noticing. BP did not realize that fishermen on the east coast of America were a critical stakeholder, and that stakeholder nearly brought down the company. Yes? Beware the stakeholder you're not noticing. So don't just ask your team who their stakeholders are. Ask them also which are the ones they're not noticing. Second one. We got together when we, when we first, uh, about 15 years ago, we started to develop coaching supervision training, which we still run. We got together all the... the, the People we'd first trained. D David Webster was on our very first ever coach supervision training in 2003. Um, several other people in the room trained with us. And we got them together. We said, let's look at the patterns of what happens in supervision. And um, what do you think the thing that coaches most moan about in supervision? Right? I'll tell you. They moan. The biggest moan that turns up in supervision, and it goes right across countries. This is informal qualitative research, right, is they come in and say, oh, we have this fantastic coaching session. There was a moment of aha and insight. I say, so what's the problem? They say, they came back a month later and they hadn't done anything about it. They hadn't followed through. And what's interesting is what happens next for the coach. They say, they then blame the client. Oh, they weren't committed. I'm not sure they're coachable. Um, that they're too full, you know, they're so busy they can't change themselves. Rather than ask the question, what do we need to change about the coaching? After that, we did quite a bit more research. We came up with the notion, which was a very simple line, that unless the change happens in the room, it's unlikely to happen outside the room. Right? So one thing I disagree with David, sorry, I'm sorry David's not here for me to say it, is that just thinking differently, if it's thinking in your neocortex, is not enough. This is where we, make, we, we agree to things. It's not where change happens. So unless we as coaches create an embodied shift in the room, in us, in the, the client, between us, right? So it's not a matter of working out at the end of grow. What was, what, what's it David called it? <laughs> um, get, get rich or waffle. Right. I took it very personally. <laughs> um, unless the change happens in the room. So, so actually, just getting to a moment of our aha insight. You know that famous old British saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Agreement you make with words and with your neocortex. Commitment is always embodied. 
So now we've, we've built into coaching fast forward rehearsals. So you've told me about how you're going to relate better to your wife, yes? Now I'm going to say, okay, so imagine, you know, you're going to see her tonight? I might say, so how are you going to open that conversation you've just, we've just discussed that you need to have with her? Yeah? And I'd say, show, don't tell me, show me what's your opening line. Imagine she's here sitting on this empty chair. So we do a fast forward rehearsal. Why? Because it translates the learning out of the neocortex into the body. And it starts to, and we might, I might give you some feedback and say, um, well, now, now try just saying it as if you mean it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I might give some direct feedback. So we're taking coach, you know, if you're coaching somebody in golf, you don't do it in the clubhouse. You don't do the football coaching in this room. You do the coaching out there on the pitch. So somewhere we need to get the pitch into the coaching room. Um, it also means, this is our four levels of engagement. Do, do we just coach around the facts or around the behaviours? This links to what, what David was saying this morning, or around the feelings, or around the fundamental assumptions, our b belief systems that are creating the feelings, that produce the behaviour, that create the phenomena that we're then moaning about. <coughs> How do we spend our coaching session spending more time down here in that sort of proportion rather than the other way around. Third one, coaching culture. I spoke to an HR director of a global company, right? She's not in the room, different conference. She was very proud. She was telling me how she had PC and I read your book. We are doing great. We've got a whole panel around the world of really top class assessed by David Clutterbuck coaches, right? We've got a um, fantastic internal coaching community with supervision. We've got managers all trained in coaching skills, right? She says, you know, it's great. Said, that's fantastic. I said, so how many coaching conversations do you think happen in your organization every, every week? She said, oh, it must be thousands. So that's fantastic. I said, okay. I said, so let me ask you another question. How does your organization learn from those thousands per week conversations? And she did the Dundee drop, you know. I have no idea, she said. A coaching culture is not an organization that has lots of coaching happening in it. Yes? This is why I wanted to show the film, which we won't have time for. But it's, it's you, you go look at Connect Assist, I'll show you, I'll give you the link, and you can, you can look at it, which is how do we make coaching embedded in how we engage with every single stakeholder? How do we make coaching? So I gave a speech on how, how coaching could save the NHS, but not as we know it. And that is coaching, not as we know it, and the NHS, not as we know it. Right? Because coaching in the NHS has to move from coaching the senior most privileged to how do we get coaching, how every doctor, every nurse, every physiotherapist engages with patients and their families. So we stop treating patients and we start partnering human beings on managing their own health. Right? That is critical if we're going to have an NHS in the next 10 years. So, the example I was going to give you, um, Connect Assist, it's 10 miles north from here, in Nant Garu. If you go onto their website, you can look at the film. There's a lovely one, uh, Leadership in Connect Assist. Because it's made by, it employs 120 people, it's made by a lot of the people right in the middle of the organisation, the junior staff, not made by the people at the top, about their culture and talking to each other about what, what, what is leadership and how is it different here? And what, how is it different from their previous job? And that's something about how do you get coaching as, as a, a value base within how everything happens. <coughs> coaching into how you do team meetings. Coaching into how do you engage in the corridor. Secondly, from focusing on learning to focusing on unlearning, um, I, I wrote an article, some of you may have read it, in Coaching at Work called Crack in the Shell. If you haven't, send, send me an email and I'll send it to you. It's seven things that they teach you on coach training courses that you have to unlearn in order to work systemically. Yeah? The client is the person opposite me. I need to be on their agenda of what they think they want. Leave your experience outside the coaching room. Interventions are always questions. You should not interrupt. You end with an action plan. Coaching is about personal development. I think all those belief systems that, that are around still in a lot of our literature and a lot of our training, we have to, we have to unlearn. Yeah? And I just... Read the article. We haven't got time. 
Okay, coaching supervision, we won't... Um, well, let me just say one thing about coaching supervision. And, and, and that is, I think we've, we've for a long time had to battle with the notion that you know, supervision is what you do when you're in training, rather than supervision isn't just for Christmas, it's for life. Why? Because it doesn't matter how masterful you are, how many years you practice, what David said this morning, there's no correlation with making you a better supervision. You are only as good as you continue to reflect. And the difficulty with reflecting by oneself is the counter-transference. <laughs> right? A couple of people got that joke. Yes, it's, 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 it's all your... You're doing it within your own belief systems and your own assumptions and your own blind spots, deaf spots and dumb spots. Yeah? You do it with a peer, two-way, there's enormous uh, things around collusion. My, my colleague Margaret Heffernan wrote a brilliant book called Willful Blindness, which was a study of Enron and BP. Right? And lots of social psychology experiments. And she links the two. Right? The one that's most worrying for those of us who do team coaching, David, is the one that uh, they, they, they put people in a room and they thought they were being measured on filling in forms and how fast they could fill in forms. And after five minutes, they put smoke under the door. And they timed how long before people did something about it. There's just one person in the room, right? after about seven minutes on average. No, no correlation with age or gender or intelligence, right? They do something about it. If you put seven people in the room, how long do you think before they do something? Ten minutes or twelve. No, it's something around... It, it's, it's nearly twice as long. If you put 35 people in the room, so beware this afternoon, 35 people in the room, nobody does anything and they have to stop the experiment. Right? So... Believe me, as a species, we have inordinate degrees of willful blindness. And we have that as coaches, not just as clients. All right, team coaching. <coughs> and I, j j just for those of you, I thought David's talk was, was, was fantastic in terms of, and he made the real case for, for why actually we could probably accelerate coaching if we could do a lot more team coaching. But I want to say one thing, beware. Because traditionally, this, this model in, in my book on leadership team coaching was to say that traditionally we've done most of the, the coaching down here, inside the team, on how they meet together. Yeah? I did a piece of work with a very large government department going through a massive transformation. They said, Peter, will you come and team coach us? I said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, what? Why do you want team coaching? They said, the cabinet secretary told us we had to. This was a permanent secretary. And I said, well, how can I help you? This was several years, quite a few years back. They said, well, come in and sit in our meeting. Their meetings were perfect. They were a great team in their meetings. The one day, the half a day a week they were together, they stopped being a team the moment they walked out of the door. That's not where the problem was. It was not down here, right? They went back to being chief executive of Job Centre Plus, <laughs> the pension service, the disability service, the HR director, the finance director. And there was no conflict in the top team. The conflict was all at third level because of the conflict that was not happening at the top team. Does that make sense? So you can read more about that, but I just want to say that be careful that we then see the team as the next unit rather than, as, as David started to say at the end of his talk, it's not what the team just does when they're, you know, they need to have a clear commission, why they're a team, be clear about what they need to focus on, have great processes for how they work together, but then the real value is created in their ability for every member of the team to represent the whole team every time they're with a stakeholder. And, as David pointed out very clearly this morning, David Webster, they need to be a learning team. And my, my, my acid test for that is, could everyone in the team say, this is what I can do this year that I couldn't do last year because of how the team has enabled me. And can the team say, this is what we can collectively do together this year that we couldn't do last year because of the way we have coached and developed ourselves. So those are the five. And finally, just to say, be part of creating the organization for the future. Because the organization of tomorrow are going to be totally different than the organizations of today. 
the B team, with people like Richard Branson and uh, the CEO of Unilever on it, are talking about beyond business as usual, in a world in which the purpose of business is to become a driving force for social, environmental, and economic benefit. And those are some of the things that we have to move to as organizations. So how can we, as coaches, help organizations, as well as individuals, move from business as usual to being fit for the future? If you have been listening, thank you. And remember, my grandchildren are relying on each and every one of you. Thank you.